Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service on the podcast today. We have Mark Moglin. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much, Thomas. Glad to be here. Glad to hear it. Would you like to take a moment and just tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Well, uh, I'm currently the uh, incoming CEO of an electric bike company in Mexico, although I'm not from Mexico. I'm actually from the United States. And the way I got here was quite a circuitous route. Um, I started my undergrad career at UC Berkeley, uh, designing my own course of study in music and perception. I really in- I'm a musician. I was really inspired about the idea of how we understand and perceive music. I ended up uh, pursuing graduate studies on that subject in England and later in Germany uh, and found myself you know, going more deeply into technology and perception. Um, and uh, basically, I was looking for ways to turn this into a business and, and led, led to uh, launching a peer-to-peer uh, music licensing service. And that led to consulting for uh, startups in the music space. Uh, and I found that I really liked the consulting aspect, you know, helping companies uh, raise capital in the media space and uh, had some success with that pitching to investors in Silicon Valley. The company I was working for at the time was based in Asia. So um, they needed someone on the ground to help uh, talk to investors. So I got this incredible experience pitching to, you know, some of these top VCs in Silicon Valley, you know, on stages in front of hundreds of people at conferences, as well as uh, face to face. I decided I wanted to get an MBA and that brought me to upstate New York uh, to Simon Business School where I got an MBA and continued my consulting practice, uh, specifically helping companies, uh, small and medium sized companies primarily uh, with their pitch decks uh, and with their company overview. So again, trying to attract uh, investors, clients and partners. Um, This, my MBA, during my MBA, I I studied for a term at, uh, in Mexico uh, at Ipade Business School and that introduced me to Mexico and I I saw so many opportunities here. So now I'm uh, based here full time and and helping to develop a uh, e-bike company. Uh, So it's really exciting. Obviously electric electric, electrical bikes are the future. Um, Sustainability is the future. So I'm very excited to be working on this project. I also take on some uh, private consulting clients to help them with their pitch decks and uh, raising investor capital. Uh, throughout this experience, I've had a, quite a bit of number of experiences selling, and in fact, pitching a company is largely a sales type activity. So, what I really wanted to talk to you today about, Thomas, if you're open to it, is uh, the sales pitch, and you know how we can convey our ideas in a compelling way, um, you know, here in the 21st century. Yeah, that'd be great. The only one thing I wanted to follow up with you on about uh, what's what's potential potentially going to be in the future is is working under palm trees going to be in the future i certainly hope so uh, <laughs> yeah i am currently based in mexico uh and there's a lot of palm trees and i that's a whole nother podcast i i'd be happy to talk about the benefit <laughs> working uh in mexico in particular and outside of the united states in general but i'm, I'm more familiar with mexico uh, there's lots of benefits to it uh, if you're if you're from Europe or the United States, uh, but that's we we might touch upon it a little bit here, but uh, it's it's definitely uh, an exciting prospect. So the the sales pitch conversation, I just wanted to preempt it with a couple of things, which were um, anyone can sort of stretch the truth, so anyone can go out and say claim something that's not supported. So our conversation is going to be about um, essentially ethical persuasion, for lack of a better, better term. And the second point was the fact that you're invited to pitch. So it wouldn't be sort of like underhanded. It is someone's given you the platform and you're kind of presenting your services either kind of um, over a maybe an inbound sales call or on, uh, as you said previously, on the stage or at an investor investor type scenario. So with those two premises, um, what do you think would be, if someone asked you, um, you know, I'm, I'm about to do this type of sales pitch, what would you say are things that you would encourage them to do in that scenario? Yeah, well, and it's interesting that you bring up the, the investor pitching scenario, pitching on stage. 
I mean, the first thing to look at here is there's so many different scenarios where you're going to be pitching. And you need to be sensitive to that. Are you calling them up? Are you emailing? Are you talking on an elevator? Are you talking in a cafe or a bar? Are you on a stage? Are you in their office? These are all different scenarios, and you need to be sensitive to those. Um, the, the first thing I would say is that all of those things outside of the pitch, and I'll just say pitch, whether it's sales or investors or whatever you're trying to promote, the most important thing is all of the aspects outside of the product or service that you're looking at. So those aspects are like your professionalism, your communication skills, your ability to speak in front of a crowd, your ability to follow up in a prompt manner. Um, all, all of that stuff is really crucial. And it, people, people understand that. So a lot of you know, motivational speakers and everybody uh, in that domain, they tend to speak about your energy, you know, how enthusiastic you are, how inspired you are. And I think there's some real truth to that. I think you need to find your inspiration, find your why, if you will, and really understand what is exciting and compelling about what you're offering. If you're not excited and compelled about it, chances are the person that you're trying to uh, sell to is not going to get that energy. So first and foremost, you really got to be inspired. You really got to be energetic. Would you agree with that? Uh, it reminds me of a quote. I'm not sure if you've heard any Zig Ziglar at all. But Zig used to say uh, that sales is a transfer of feeling. And that kind of sums up exactly what you just said. Right. So that's baseline. If you're not excited, if you're not interested, if you're not doing all those exogenous factors related to your professionalism and communication skills. And look, if you need to improve in those skills, improve in those skills. Like if you need to take courses on public speaking, it's, I would highly recommend it. Or if you maybe just are a natural public speaker, that's great. Some people don't have that skill. And by the way, public speaking is a good skill, even if you're not pitching publicly. It's, it's about confidence, it's about conveying ideas, it's about presentation. So I'd recommend, you know, and even if you're talking in front of a mirror and just talking it out and, and, and recording yourself and seeing how you sound and asking friends how you sound, because you really need to improve your communications if you're going to be pitching a product. So I see, you'd be surprised at how many people just don't take that initial step of improving their professionalism and clarity and communications. Um, the other aspect that I would look at is, uh, is, 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 is really what I derive from the pitch deck. And, and I see the pitch deck as a, and for those of you who aren't that familiar, the pitch deck is just basically a eight to 12 slide presentation that goes over what a product or service is doing for a company and tell some of the main value propositions, talks about the team, and that's and it's a way to convey what your company is all about. But I think the pitch deck has a lot more potential than that. I think the pitch deck could be used for practically anything. I could, it could even be used for who you are. You can make a pitch about who you are and what you're all about. So I like to look things in terms of this, uh, this the deck scenario. And, and one crucial thing that I look at about the deck, besides how you deliver it, which we just addressed, that you need to do it with energy, is that it's a forward-looking document, not just a backward-looking document. And this, again, you wouldn't imagine, so many people forget about this, but you need to be talking about where you're going as a company, where you're going as a product, how you are innovating, not just the things you did and what your sales were last year, that's good to know, but how are you actually changing the game? How are you actually innovating? Because as we both know, Thomas, if you're not in, in today's world, if you're not actually innovating and bringing something new to the table, you're going to be a dinosaur pretty quick if you're not already a dinosaur, right? <laughs> so innovating is not an option. It doesn't matter who you are, or what domain you're in. You need to innovate. You need to show how you have a, a competitive advantage, show how you're integrating next generation technologies. So that is part of your pitch. If you're in a sales pitch, whatever it is, you need to be talking about not only how this will, how you are an innovative product and service, but how you will make your client more innovative. Really good point, actually. Um, I've got a fair amount of sales background, but I haven't heard that um, that point made in the sense that you know it's not all about what you've done previously, which people so heavily focus on in sales. It's about what you're going to do going forward. I really like that point. I think it's crucial and I would be, you know, you would be uh, amazed how many people miss this point. Um, 
it's it's just you know no you know you're the people who you're pitching to are not psychic right they don't know what you're thinking they don't know you know the conversations you've had uh, about where your company can go but open up about it open up about this is where we're thinking we can go this is how we're thinking we can integrate next generation technologies when i'm talking about next generation technologies i'm talking about the fourth industrial revolution i'm talking about iot vr ar blockchain uh ai and the like these are the technologies that investors and your clients will look for in terms of is there some connection to these technologies because we know those are going to be more and more prominent in the future well, you touched on something as well which um I have covered before and I think it's worth highlighting um, and that is um, don't assume knowledge on the part of the person that you're speaking to so you know you and I might have um, education or information about our particular businesses but don't assume that the person you're speaking to has that knowledge and so like you said they're not psychic they need to be told you know in in that context what your plans are and where you intend to to go with it Exactly. And particularly on the innovation front, because even if they get some idea about what your product is all about, how are they going to know how you're going to change in the future? How are they going to know what your plans are? How are they going to know how you're thinking? How are you going to change? How, no one wants a stagnant product or a stagnant service. You know, so that's that's the part where it's more of a conversation. And if you if you need to read up on innovation and look at, well, what are your innovation methodologies you're applying? Do that. You know, innovation is a very loaded word, and I don't think we're going to have enough time to really go into it now, but it's a really complex and dynamic field. So you need to understand, if you're innovating, you kind of, you need to know how you're innova innovating, why you're innovating, uh, and so on. So let's, but I think we can leave it at that, but definitely you want to um, uh, be sensitive to to your innovation strategy. And if you don't have an innovation strategy, you need to start looking into it. You need to start looking into how your product is going to transform, how your company is going to transform. And then if you're in sales, what you're going to do to present uh, that innovation strategy. So as a sort of couple of, I don't know, bullet points or a summary, um, get um, proficient or look into public speaking and include innovation uh, or at least think about that in terms of where your product will be and make sure you're the person who's receiving that pitch is aware of what that company's um, going to, how that company is going to innovate going forward. What would you say um, are the main mistakes that people make when pitching? Yeah, great question. You know, it's practically a cliche now when you go to a Silicon Valley pitching event and you see this, uh, usually a tech guy with potentially an interesting technology, but he or she doesn't know how to present, uh, has this really boring PowerPoint presentation with like a black background and white text, or even worse, a white background and black text, and like a couple screenshots. And they don't know, seems like it's their first time talking in front of a crowd, or might as well be. And it's just a really sad affair. Like it doesn't matter how cool their product is. They don't have the delivery. They don't have the presentation and everyone is just waiting for this thing to end. So we can hopefully get a more exciting speaker on that. So look, you cannot discount the delivery. You cannot discount your ability to present. Here's a step further you should take. Again, extremely rare that people take this step, but you, you should think about hiring a designer or an artist to go over your pitch deck and make sure that it looks good. Go over your presentation and clean it up. And you say, oh, no, no, I'm a great artist. Don't worry, I know how to make a great PowerPoint. Okay, that's why there's artists and designers. They know more than you. They have a better eye than you. You should hire them. You should get it looked at. It will, you know, they can do subtle things that you would not even be aware of, but it has an immense impact on your audience. So. There's services like Fiverr now. There's a lot of other services out there. Uh, there's ways to hire designers very easily if you don't know any, but have someone look at it, brush up the design. And again, the delivery, you gotta have both, design and delivery. So that's that's the primary mistake you see. Some other complaints that I've seen uh, VCs have is like, if, if the speaker doesn't memorize what they wanna say, if they're reading from cards, some VCs don't like that. 
Um, I see a common complaint is the text is too small or there's too much text. That's a common complaint. Like it shouldn't be read like a, like a business proposal. It should be a couple of bullet points per page and you should be able to talk and elaborate on those points. So those are some of the, those are some of the main issues that I see, uh, uh, when it comes to the, to pitching in general. And they're directly applicable, applicable to the sales pitch as well. Well, the first point you raised um, is kind of like it reminds me of implications. So, um, if they're if they they haven't bothered to do their own kind of design for their presentation, it implies that they're not willing to in a way. And if if you're sitting across from someone who's potentially going to give you a large amount of money, um, it doesn't bode well as a as a starting point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. We need to be humble about our artistic abilities. You know, there's people that study this stuff, you know, <laughs> let them do their work, let them fix it up. And, um, and, and that's, and that's your brand. That's your brand. That's your marketing. So, so check it out. Things are really affordable these days. It's worth it. Um, another interesting point about pitching is that it's not just you talking in front of a wall or a mirror. There's an actual human and they can interrupt you. And particularly VCs, they tend to do that a lot. They tend to want to get to their own points. They might be just concerned about ROI or just concerned about some revenue measure or just concerned about some other aspect. And they'll just ask you that question. doesn't matter. They're not going to wait for your whole presentation, right? So you got to be prepared to take interruptions and to deal with them and to answer those questions accordingly. So you better have a good answer. You know, you better be prepared for anything that could come out of left field. Same thing with the sales pitch. I'm sure you've experienced this, right? Where, you know, a client wants to take it on a different track or talk about a different point. Maybe you weren't prepared to talk about it, but you need to be clear about it and, and have a, and have a good answer. Um, and, and, and usually it works to say, Hey, I'll follow up with you later, but, uh, you can't use that one all the time. You got to be clear about where you're going. And, uh, particularly in the context of investor pitching, you really need to have pretty direct answers for pretty much everything or, or they could lose interest. But investors are a special class of people. Um, uh, and they have, you know, they have their own concerns. <laughs> yeah, you can use the, um, I'll come back to you one, once or twice, but too many of those is, uh, <laughs> is not good, is it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, this is just basic, you know, have, have basic communications, having strong communications, uh, strong conversational ability, but there's also some other exogenous factors that are really important. I'm sure you've seen this play out in your work, Thomas, is all of those aspects which go into selling outside of the sale. Like, hey, I happen to know this person because we went to the same school or we're in the same club um, or whatever it might be. So some connection that you have or you build a connection. Hey, let's talk about this in a cafe or a pub. Let's let's have a more casual conversation. And all of a sudden you're talking about, you find out that you both like music or you both are musicians or you both, what have you. And these kinds of personal connections are so important. Some people think it's actually the most important thing. And I, I think there's a fair argument to be made in that in terms of really making a connection to the person. So kind of human to human interaction that actually drives the sale. Have you seen that as essential in, in your work? Um, I can't say on, honestly, I think it is very valuable in that context. I can't say I'm very good at it is the only thing. So, um, you know, you get natural salespeople who, cause the, the phrase, right, is rapport, right? In a sales context, it's like, do you have rapport with that person and are you able to connect with them? Um, I tend to, it's a personality thing. So I tend to have to rely on, um, data in a way. So, um, and also telling the truth. So I think that there's an edge um, with being honest and then also providing data to support your claims. Um, and I rely on that more than I would my connection with the other human being, because I'm just not, um, I warm up to people over a longer period of time, which is not ideal for sales, but that's what I rely on. But I 100% see um, what you mean by the point, And I agree with it. Right. For you, it might be more of an icing on the cake type of thing. Uh, maybe not your, your primary means, depending what business you're in. For some people, it's more of their primary 
means of getting things done is doing a round of golf or, uh, you know, taking someone out to a dinner and creating a personal connection. And that's your foothold into a, a larger client deal. But just keep it in mind, whatever you're selling, whatever you happen to be uh, pushing or pulling or talking about, understand that for your industry, usually it's industry specific, but it's also salesperson specific. And that might play into more or less your strategy for for convincing somebody. Um but I think we, we need to clear something up. And I, and I, I want to get your, your view on this, Thomas. But, but so much of sales, like there's a lot of bad connotations about sales, right? Like we have this, uh, this idea of someone trying to push something that you don't want. Um, but so much of effective sales, it seems you're not really selling anything. You're really presenting someone with an option that you view as favorable. You're, and you'd like to share it and they might agree with you or not, but it's not really a pushing of anything. And particularly in a downturn economy, uh, wallets are even tighter. So it's really only the essential aspects that are going to grow businesses or improve someone's life that are actually going to have value. So how is it, do you, what's your view on that in, in terms of sales really not being about selling and about, you know, presenting a better option or, or what would you call it? Uh, I certainly think that's the way that I would do it. So you present, um, as you say, an option and it's up to the other person whether they go ahead with it or not. And I think, um, you know, there's a, a phrase buyer's remorse. I think that if they're the ones that make the decision, then buyer's remorse is much, much lower than it would be if someone was pressured into it. I have seen some instances, um, documentaries or whatever it might be, where pressure selling is uh, something that's done. Um, but I just think from a longevity perspective um, and, you know, having having an easier life is much better if someone else makes the decision than it is um, if you make it for them or their pressure sold. Is that kind of what you meant? Yes. Yeah. I mean, at least when someone's trying to push something on me, that's usually when I step back. Right. If you get too many calls from the salesperson, that's when you step back. Um, so, so that's that's exactly what I mean, right? I mean, it, it, it's if you find yourself and you're pushing something or you're calling someone too much, they may be wasting your time because you need to be able to read your client. You know, it's there. It's it's certainly conceivable that a client is interested, but they don't have the capacity to buy your product, uh, or they have the capacity, but they're not interested, or they just don't like to tell you no, so they like to lead you on for a while. Well, read the tea leaves, figure out when you need to move on. And like most things in life, it's kind of a numbers game. You need to reach out to a large pool of your prospective clients. The trick is finding the right pool and, and having the pool, having the proper leads. So there's different strategies for doing that. But if you don't have a good pool of people that you're going after, you need to start there. You need to definitely start there. Um, you know, as a CEO, I spend at least 50% of my time concerned with sales. Sales is what drives the organization. If you don't have sales, if you don't have revenue coming in, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You need, that's the lifeblood. So sales is not a bad word. I used to be afraid of it myself, but it turns out that it's essential for really any organization. So there's a lot of other things I'm concerned about and I need to be concerned about, but I'm spending at least half of my time just on making sure those sales are going through. So that's, it's, it's really something you need to put front and center in your business and, and really create a priority for that every day in your work. I agree. Just um, coming back to one thing that you mentioned uh, previously, which kind of popped up in my head to ask you about, which was you mentioned that it was, should we say favorable or you would recommend memorizing your pitch rather than doing sort of like a flashcard uh, type scenario? Um, I can, I can hear people saying, you know, if you're, if you're presenting publicly um, in that way or speaking from a stage or something like that, um, you know, they want to have as much uh, written down just in case they forget it or something like that. What would you recommend in that kind of scenario? It's kind of like, you know, a corporate manager reading your resume. 
right? You think they're going to read it word for word. And it turns out they have a stack of 100 resumes. And then after you, they got to look, they got to fill another job that has another stack of 100 resumes. They might start out trying to read the resumes. By the time they get to number 26, they're like, come on, what, what's, what's, what, what school did you go to? What was the last job? That, that's all they're concerned about, right? Same thing when you're pitching to an investor or in many sales scenarios, they kind of want to get to the point. So I think all of those questions you asked are good, but they tend to obscure the point, which is that you need to just be conversational about your product. You need to just look like you're speaking about it like it's a conversation. So actually, even if you memorize it, you can look like you're just memorizing something and then saying it. It doesn't come off as that attractive. It's better just to talk off the cuff. And even if you miss a point or two, no problem, because again, they're not even looking at these periphery points. They're just trying to get the idea. And part of the idea is you and how you're presenting it. Does that, does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. Um, I think that probably the thing that would help someone who is asking that question might be that they actually need to get out and do it um, so that they can get past those first few awkward instances where they do forget, for example. Um, but you're, you're essentially saying that um, regardless of whether you have flashcards or you memorize it in your head, you still need to present it in a way that's human, um, you know, take questions and be able to talk, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, as 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 a kid, I did some professional theater. I was, I was an actor. And what I learned pretty quickly was that if you did forget a line, it was better just to move on to the next line, Right. So your audience isn't going to know the point you missed. They will know when you stumble or when you slow down or when you look like you're thinking about something too much. So to get past that awkwardness, yeah, try to understand all the talking points. But the point is that you're able to talk about it fluidly. So you need to be talking about your subject every chance you get. We used to have in-person conferences. Now we have Zoom conferences. So it's a little more difficult. But you need to be having conversations in your domain, in your field with other experts. Be highly conversational about it. Watch good YouTube content about it. Be able to talk about all kinds of issues periphery to your, your primary issue, and that will help a lot. Then, yeah, write down, take, take some notes. But those notes are just in the background. You're not memorizing anything. You're not, you're not re reading wrote for, you know, wrote word for word anything, right? You're, it's all about just talking about it. It's okay if you miss a point or two. You'll probably say a point or two that you weren't even anticipating saying because that's a conversation. That's what natural speech is all about. And that's a lot more compelling as a sales pitch than memorizing something because now we even have robots that can memorize stuff. So then you're not much more impressive than a robot at that point, right? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're not really needed at that point, are you? Um, I, I did have something that I wanted to ask you about, which was how much do you think that you should speak about what's in it for them versus for lack of a better better term how great you are so a lot of people some people all they do is they build themselves up so that someone is you know going to do business with them and some people focus very much on what's in it for the other person do you have a preference or would you say it's a balance actually i was i was just going to go there so it's crucial to know your client it's crucial to know your client. And you need to know more than just what the, how your client might be interested in using your product and service. You need to know your client. You need to know what their business is all about. And I even think it's a great way to start a conversation. Oh, I know what your business is all about. This is what happened in your industry recently. This must be something you're thinking about. Wow, what do you think of that? Okay, yeah, now you can see that I know something about what you're doing and I care about it. Now let me talk about what I'm doing and how it can help you. That's a lot more interesting than let me present you this product that I think can fit into your world somehow. Do you see the difference? Hmm. So, you know, and you say, well, I have a huge variety of clients. I can't know all my clients. Okay, they have a website, <laughs> right? They have, they have a LinkedIn profile. Do some research, understand who they are and what moves in their world. Because they're not waking up in the morning thinking about your product. 
they're waking up and thinking about all of the concerns of their industry and of the world that they're in. Does that make sense? Total sense, yeah. Um, I, I agree as well. I think, although I think both can be successful, I think um, really people care about what um, what's important to them, right? Right. And it shows that you're genuinely interested. It shows that like I'm, I'm selling into your industry or I'm selling into your company, but I care about what your company's doing and what's going on in your industry. It really shows that you care about your client when you understand their industry and understand their uh, company. And it shows that you're genuinely interested. So I want to talk about some th- aspects of, of companies and uh, that, that we need to keep in mind, right? First of all, not and this and this is how it affects your sales team and your sales force. It's been noted that not everyone in the company is highly engaged and highly excited. And I will say the number one inhibition to a salesperson performing or anyone in a sales capacity is the team they're in. Is the team they're in. So in a company, around 15% of people are highly engaged in moving your company forward. About 35% or so are just are doing a great job and, and, and a really, you know, a, a productive force. About 35% are like more or less stagnant or not doing much for your company. And a good 15% are probably at odds with your company. And this is, this is based on research that's been conducted. So it, 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 a, a significant percentage, you, know, you could say it's only 5%, but a significant percentage of people like are at odds with your company. I'm talking about the people that are working at your company. They don't like what's going on. And why don't they like what's going on? Because of the culture, okay? Because of the political stuff, because of all that stuff, because of the conversations, probably nothing to do with the product or service, probably everything to do with how they're being respected and how they're being valued. So, and I've been in sales scenarios where I, where I made sales and they weren't honored or they weren't properly respected or, or, or looked at. So that puts a big damper on things, right? So you need, you need to respect your sales force and understand there's a lot of activities going on outside, outside of sales that support the sales. So one person makes the sale, but it took five people to support that person. So why are you only rewarding the salesperson? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and sometimes there's not complete trans. Sorry, if you're a CEO, I hate to break this to you, by the way. If you're a CEO, and I am as well, so I get it, there's not complete transparency in who's doing all the work for that sale. Surprise. So you need to be really looking at who's involved in that process and making sure that everyone feels respected and honored within it, or else you're going to lose performance on the team, which is going to affect your sales. So um, I, I, wonder, I wonder how much you think that, that group dynamics and that in, inevitable and variable political social stuff we see in the corporate world, how that's affecting the, the, the sales uh, function in particular. Uh, I think it's a great point about it's not just the person who uh, gets the yes that's important. Um, I, I would say that it's down to the ability to to have processes. So if it is the case that people are getting sales, legitimate sales, uh, and then it falls down as a result of, let's say, you know, as you said, five other people who might be involved in it, I would say probably the process needs to be looked at in order in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. But to your point about rewarding other people, I also think I'm, I'm a strong believer in incentives. So everyone should have an incentive to do a good job. Um, even if they're, let's say they're annoyed uh, of being in the company, they should still have an incentive to, to do a good job. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. But incentives are, are rewards right? They're, they're the carrot out there. That's a good thing. If you don't have a carrot, but you're being asked to work for something and you don't get a reward for that and someone else gets the reward for that, we know that's a problem. So be aware that there's, that there's dynamics going on that you don't see if you're a manager. There's, dyna- there's dynamics going on that you don't see and try to see it, try to understand it. And you know, if your whole organization at the end of the day is not making sales, which 
invariably that's basically what it's about, then you need to understand all the all the people and all processes going into that and and reward the people according and reward the people involved accordingly. <clears throat> Another point I'll, I'll make is that I don't it doesn't matter what position you're in. You could be a marketing coordinator, you could be a uh you know an intern, you could be uh, a VP. You need to be entrepreneurial in everything you do. And I guess this is a bit of my uh, Silicon Valley DNA coming out of me. You know, in Silicon Valley, you like, you'll bump into someone on the street and they're an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? Your bus driver is an entrepreneur. It's, 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 you know, and then I studied in, in, in the uh, Eastern part of the United States in upstate New York and coming from an entrepreneurial background was a little bit different. Like, oh, that's kind of special. You know, you work with startups and you launch your own startups. Like that's, that's, that's different. And I suppose it's same in much, the same in much of the world. If you go to Europe and so on, entrepreneurs are kind of a rarity, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, in Silicon Valley, it's just like there's more entrepreneurs than anyone. So and that's kind of where I was bred. And, and so I do have this DNA in me where I feel like you should be entrepreneurial in everything you do. Having a corporate position does not preclude you from being entrepreneurial. In fact, you should take an entrepreneurial outlook. You should be, be willing to knock on anyone's doors, move anything forward. You see a problem, you try to fix it. You see an opportunity for innovation, you go for it, and so on. Now, here's the, here's the catch with that. Not everybody likes it when they see you do that. You'll move, the, you, you, chances are you'll move the organization forward more than you thought imaginable, and you'll probably do 10 times more than what they expected from you. But amazingly, not everyone likes you for it. I guess you can probably guess the reasons why, but mm -hmm. at some point you step on someone's toes or I don't know what, you know, mission creep or something, right? So look, it's, in my opinion, you should still do it. You should still go for it. You should still be entrepreneurial. And when you find that it's really not working out for you or you're not being respected properly, or you're even being penalized for it, then chances are you belong in a different organization and in a better position. You haven't found your home yet. You haven't found your purpose yet. Mm. And if you find that I'm at, you're in an organization and your main job is to keep your mouth shut and to not move the ball forward, does that really sound like it's your purpose in life? That sounds probably not, you know, so you need to, at that point, start asking what your purpose is and what is a better scenario for you. It's a tough path. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, when you find that you are on the right track and have found your purpose and are in the right position where you're being respected, or if necessary, you're starting your own business. I shouldn't just say if necessary, obviously, it's a great idea to start your own business, but it, maybe that's your purpose, whatever it is. You should be entrepreneurial and you should always try to move the company forward, in my opinion. What do you think about it? I think it's a great point. Um, I think that I used to think that, I mean, maybe it's not exactly what you meant, um, but I used to think that everyone should be, you know, a business owner and there's no reason not to. Um, but I sort of changed my stance on it when you look at the stats. So um, I'm sure you're aware of all the business stats and everything. So uh, as I understand it, uh, over a 10-year period or 7 to 10-year period or something like that, it's only 1% to 3% of people uh, who started a business are still in that business or it's a su successful business, for example. But I think um, what you mean by that is being entrepreneurial just sort of means solving problems, right? So if, you, if you're entrepreneurial within, a, for example, a corporate company, you're, you're looking to solve problems and, as you said, move the company forward. I think, yeah, it's a great, great philosophy to have. It, that's my point exactly. It's not that you should go out and be an entrepreneur. Maybe that is your calling. Maybe that is your path. It's that you're the entrepreneur of your world. You're the entrepreneur of your position, right? And that's, you always have to take that attitude. doesn't matter what position you have. And that's how you're actually going to move the organization forward. Look, if I have, if, you know, have people in my organization, I want everyone to try to move the organization forward, right? If someone is trying to slow it down or 
divert it or whatever, that's probably not the kind of person I want in my organization, right? Mm. Problem is we know that a good five to 15% of people in organizations are doing just that. <laughs> They're going counter to, to what you want as a company, most likely because of the, of cultural issues. What I mean by cultural is they're not being respected. They're not being honored. They're not being rewarded. They're not being seen. They're not being valued. So that's, that's what we need to think about, you know, whether you're in a corporate position or have your own business or anything, taking that entrepreneurial attitude. And, um, yeah, it comes with a certain degree of risk, but everything comes with a certain degree of risk, right? It's also a degree of risk just to keep your mouth shut and keep doing your work and feel like you're in a terrible scenario that, that, you, that isn't supporting you, your career, or your or your dreams. Yeah, yeah I think um, there's a quote, uh, if you don't risk anything, then you risk everything. And I think that pretty much sums up what you said, right? Yeah, you can't get too comfortable. You know, I think, I think what, what, what COVID taught us, it wasn't a surprise to me because I, I've been in that mode for so long. But, you know, of, of, of always trying new things and, 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 and looking at new opportunities. But for a lot of people, it was a shock. Oh, something really big happened in the world and it changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Well, guess what? We're humans on planet Earth. There's mm. going to be some, sh- you yeah, know, I someone's, agree with you. someone's going to pass away. Someone's going to, hello, there's risk, there's shocks. Yeah, we got a big one with, with, with the pandemic. You think there's not another one around the corner? There is at some point. <laughs> there's at some point. So that's what being entrepreneurial means also. It means being aware there's going to be massive shocks. There's going to be massive disruptions. And, and how are you operating within that? And how are you even benefiting from that? Because obviously there's companies that benefit from the, from the pandemic as well, right? Like the Zoom call that we're on right now. Zoom did well, right? There's Zoom lots of companies. really well, haven't they? <laughs> Lots of companies did really well. Um, so that's, that's, that's the point. Don't think that everything's going to be just hunky dory and fine in your position forever. Why not be entrepreneurial? Why, why not, why not take a risk? Why not try to take the VP out to coffee or get a private meeting with the CEO for 10 minutes, introduce yourself, say some of your ideas. How's it going to hurt you? But you know, I tell people this sometimes, and also it's because I'm in Mexico and in Mexico, they're even more conservative and there's more of a hierarchical culture in, in the workplace. So the idea of taking a VP or a CEO out to coffee is like major no, no. Right. But in California and other places, not sure how it is where you're at, but the, why not? What's the risk? You know, you know, probably the, you know, the, the senior manager will be happy to meet you, will be impressed that you wanted to meet them, learn about what's going on in the world. Let them talk, right. Let them talk about, what, what's going on. They get to know you. It doesn't hurt. You learn something about the business. You learn something about how they got to their position in their career. And probably they'll keep you in mind when there's an opportunity to, to move up in the organization or for a special project. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of like so few people do it that it would be refreshing to have that happen if you were in a higher position. I just wanted yeah. to ask you one thing, if that's okay, regarding the, um, uh, the sales stuff. And that was, do you um, apply and what are your thoughts on measuring your performance um, and when pitching? So, for example, let's say you do 100 pitches or whatever it might be, and you get five yeses or, you know, edit the numbers, however. But um, and you make these small changes and then you might increase. Um, do you tend to agree with that or and what are your thoughts on it? Uh, you know, it's really a case by case uh, thing. So in sales, we have kind of, you know, you might look at two sides of the spectrum are like high value products, expensive products, and, uh, and, 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 and lower uh, price products. So obviously, if you're selling a lower price product, if you're selling toothpaste, you want to sell a lot of tubes of toothpaste, right? That's kind of the idea. And if you're selling cars, you just need to sell a few cars. And the sales cycles are different. The sales cycles are different. So if you're going in for a toothpaste, you know, you're just choosing, you're spending a, a minute maybe and analyzing the, uh, the, the planogram or, 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 you know, the, 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 the products and you're picking the one that might work for you. 
a car, you might spend a few weeks. You might test drive different cars. You might want a couple meetings with the uh, sales company to understand what kind of offers they can give you, what kind of financing you can get. That's a longer sales cycle. It takes longer to close the deal. So you, you got to look case by case. When you're talking about pitching companies, when you're talking about getting investors on board, again, that can be a very long sales cycle because you're asking for substantial amounts of money to invest in a company. So it's not just going to happen on the first conversation. It's going to take repeated conversations. So it becomes tricky because you don't know if people are interested or not. But I would say quality over quantity in general. You know, quality, quality over quantity is a, is, a good, is a good principle to keep in mind. But does that, does that answer your question or what do you, I'm, try, I'm trying to get to what you're asking exactly. Yeah. Um, I suppose a better way of asking it would be how, is some, how will someone know if they're doing a good job? Because typically, yeah, I, I understand what you mean by um, lower, if you're getting loads of sales calls, then you can measure that, um, I think sometimes referred to as close rate. So how many, what percentage of people are you closing Closing um, versus versus not? So are you closing 10% of the people who you talk to, for example? And then you make a few changes, you improve the quality, and let's say you get that up to 15%. But in your instance, you know, maybe you're not, um, if you're in, talking to investors, maybe you only need one, um, one sale, for example. So how, how, do you, how would someone know if they were doing a good job and how do you kind of track your performance? Yeah, again, I've been in various sales scenarios, including SaaS sales, um, you know, investor pitching. Uh, now I'm in uh, a luxury retail product. Uh, so there's, there, again, there's different scenarios, but what's important is setting up stages. So if it's a SaaS product, for example, it's will they get, will they do a demo call? Will they do an initial demo? You know, a, a 30 minute overview of your product. And for most products you're selling, there's a kind of a demo stage where they can test it out or look at it. But that's just the first touch at it. Then there's probably a second demo in which they get to use the product, you know, for, for 30 days or, or get deeper into certain features of the product. Right. So these are all stages. Did they do the first demo? Did they do the second demo? Right. Was there a quoting process where we, where we quoted and, and did some customized specifications for them? This is kind of the SaaS scenario. If you're, you know, an investor scenario, it's similar. Did, did they hear your pitch deck? Did they want to see uh, some of the numbers behind the pitch? Did they want to speak to some other members of the team, et cetera, et cetera. So you want to make sure the conversations are progressive. And if they haven't seen the initial demo or pitch, then you know you haven't even gotten off the floor, right? And if they're really interested in what you're doing, they will at, see, at least see the initial pitch. And if they're still really interested, they're going to want to ask some more questions. So you need to, whatever your product or service is, you need to break it up into these stages and then ver and then track where your potentials are in this, in these stages. I mean, that's, I think the most effective way. I mean, have you found that any clients just kind of on the first call, just jump on it and want to, want to buy your services? It happens, I guess, but usually there's multiple, multiple stages of conversation, right? Now I, I interpret, um, cause it's a, it's a good answer. I interpret that to mean that, um, you, in the instance where you're kind of attempting to get the call or attempting to get the meeting with the investor, um, that's where you measure your progress because the more of them you get, the more likely, likely you are to make the big sale. And then when you are doing that pitch, then you focus on the quality as much as you can do. That's the way I interpreted it. And I think it's a good answer. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, so it's, it's, you have overall, you have a big pool of leads, right? And another thing I had to get comfortable with in, in any kind of sales function, and as, as sales is so essential to any business, so it's just a lesson you got to learn very early on, is you're probably only going to make a relatively small percentage of sales out of your leads. So you don't want to be too attached to any given lead because, if, you know, if you're doing, if you're closing five or 10% of your leads in most industries, that's pretty good. Hmm. Well, that means you had to hear 90 no's before you got a, before you got 10 sales, right? Um, or 95 knows before you got five sales. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So you need to be nimble. You need to be moving, uh, to the right markets and to the right people. Um, 
but what I when I mean quality, I mean quality pitching every time and take it as practice. Even if you think, well, this is not a very serious potential, practice. Practice your pitch. Take them like a serious potential. You never know. They might know somebody. And and I also mean quality clients. Quality clients. You know, why waste your time on a client that's not very interested or, do, or doesn't really want to be involved too much or wants to put it away? Why not move to the clients that are really interested? So that's what I mean, what I mean by quality. And then track those stages. And that's how you see that you're making progress. So you might see, look, I didn't make many sales in a given uh, in a given term. But look how many demos I did. That's really good. That's really good. So, you, you know, if you're a manager of someone in the sales function and they're bringing people along the path, but not a lot of them are closing. Well, guess what? Not every, the salesperson is not the ruler of the universe. Maybe there's issues like a pandemic going on. Maybe there's issues like, you know, people are, you know, recalculating how they want to spend their money this, this year in 2021, right? If, if, the, if the salesperson is getting a lot of demos, that's probably pretty good. That, that's, that means they're moving people through the stages. So, you know, I, I think that we have to reframe sales as, you know, the fundamental goal of an organization in many cases, yes. But also be aware that it's so much more than, than just closing the deal. It's about your brand. It's about your reputation. It's about, uh, you know, who people think you are, what some people refer to as the halo effect. And that's why what you're doing is so great, you know, and you're just coming in with your business and you're saying, look, our whole thing is that we're doing this ethically and, and we're not going to say something we can do if we can't do it. And we're going to let you try it out. And if you don't like it for any reason, we'll give you your money back. You know what I mean? Mm. That kind of builds a great reputation and then it gets you a better client base because people, people trust you probably from the first call. They, they trust who you are, right? So. Yeah, um, it's it's an easier sale as well. So we, as you say, um, we speak to the right people, and um, they're making their own decision. But um, have you got any closing thoughts on anything that you would like to add that we haven't covered? Well, yeah, just to recap, you know, don't forget about the delivery. You know, don't forget about the inspiration. You know, yeah. the energy they bring to the conversation. That's not a small factor. Some people think it's the number one factor, mm. right? So be energetic, be excited, you know, whatever you got to do to get to that point. You should be inspired about the product you're selling and believe it's a good product. If you don't believe it's a good product, you probably should be working on another product. Okay. So you need to actually find something you're inspired by and then actually reflect that uh, passion. Super important. And as you've seen, I'm sure just a lot of people don't get this, you know, no matter how many times they hear it, they don't get that you got to be excited and interested about what you're doing. So that's okay. That's that. Then look at the presentation. Make sure it's in good design. Make sure it looks professional. Make sure your appearance is professional and make sure you have great communications, verbal communication skills and follow up communications via email or phone call or however you do it. Okay. So. That's baseline. Doesn't matter what you're selling. Doesn't matter. You got to get the, all those things in order and you can improve in any of those things. If you're not highly proficient in public speaking, for example, you can improve in any of those things. Start taking steps to doing that. And yeah, so that's basically the most important thing. And, you know, rewatch this video if you need some other tips, <laughs> but those, those, that's the most, some of the, the, the really important thing you got to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, you touched on something which I feel like would be a disservice if I didn't ask you about which is follow up is such a big thing with sales. Um, have you got any, any tips to share there? Well, just that you need to, um, you know, put in a calendar essentially when you want to follow up with someone based on their interest level and then make sure you follow up, make sure you follow up. I mean, I think the number one thing is that the ball, the ball can get dropped on certain clients. Try to follow up, try to get a conclusive answer, get a conclusive no, if possible, if it, you know, because you don't want just to be, be left hanging. And then if possible, also try to engage in those exogenous factors of, is it, if you, is it possible to take them out to coffee? Is it possible to get to know them a little bit more? Uh, for me and my, and the way I operate in a kind of networking context, 
that's really important. So see if there's a way to have a closer connection uh, in, in the sale. So execution is very important. Make sure you do it. Right. And then execute and then fulfill, you know, if you're, if you're talking about complex products, you know, that are, have long sales cycles, again, it's not just the salesperson, you know, the client requests some information, the client requests to test it out. The client requests, um, a quote, the client requests certain contracts. Well, if you're the salesperson, you better be pounding on a lot of doors to get that stuff moving because otherwise you're leaving the client hanging. Right. And it's not your job to do all those things. But if you don't do those things, it's going to hurt your potential to sell, to sell. And it looks in general, it looks like your organization doesn't have it together if they can't properly fulfill all the steps necessary. But it, particularly in startups, that's not necessarily an easy pro, uh, prospect. There's a lot of legal issues. There's a lot of regulation issues. There's a lot of documents, you know, to move the sale forward as a salesperson, you got to be ready to pound on a lot of doors and make sure that things are moving forward so that things get back to the client in a timely way. Well, thank you for all that information. I think there's definitely some nuggets there for, for people to use. In every episode I do, I always, near the end of the podcast, I always ask what your business goals are. So can you share that? Well, uh, my business goals are to expand um, a luxury uh, e-bike distributor in Mexico. And uh, we're going to be doing that through a variety of B2C and B2B means. And I think there's a, it's an exciting industry, an exciting prospect. And it has the potential to transform uh, the transportation economy in particular, get a lot of people out of cars and into e-bikes, which is better, the better for the environment, better for your health. And uh, I think it can be better for businesses as well when they, when they incorporate these kinds of opportunities for their uh, employees. Uh, beyond that, uh, I help a few private clients in their pitching and sales. If you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Mark Moglin on LinkedIn. And happy to uh, see if I can help out. That was, a, that was the next question. Where's the best place for people to find you? So it's going to be connecting on LinkedIn, yeah? That's right. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll put your uh, mention, your app mention on the screen. So um, thank you very much for being a great guest. As I said, I think there's plenty of valuable information. Um, are you happy concluding there? Yes. Pleasure speaking with you, Thomas. Thanks so much for this. It's my pleasure. And uh, I'll speak to you soon. Looking forward to it. Be well. Bye, Mark.